So in module three, what we're going to cover is we're going to take a step back a little bit and try to look at some of the reasons why we're building the EA framework, specifically <clears throat> how we can incorporate it into our statistical uh, survey cycle. Today's training will be divided into two sessions. The first session in the morning, we'll be looking at how GIS is used in a typical agricultural statistical cycle. We'll be looking at some examples of different types of satellite imagery and how it's used for statistics. And finally, we'll be looking at how we can use GIS to develop an area frame. So if you remember, the objectives of a census usually are, it's not only to build the baseline data for the country, but the second objective is to build a frame for all the other statistical activities that are built from it. <clears throat> and that uh, forms part one of our session this morning. Hmm. <clears throat> so this is a typical um, cycle of um, agricultural statistics. This is called an integrated system of surveys. An integrated system of surveys always starts with the population census. The population census helps us to define the frame for all other surveys in the country. Oops. <clears throat> so in the population census, we usually have questions related to identification of agriculture. Now, agriculture, the definition of agriculture, depends by country. But typically, it'll cover a farmer who's involved in livestock, crops, forestry, or fishery. But again, it depends on how your country is set up and how decentralized your systems are. <clears throat> but it's important to have those questions in the population census because it allows us to filter our results in order to, to inform our agricultural census. <clears throat> in the population census, like we've talked about, the last two days, is we build two things to help support our activity. The first one is the enumeration area. <clears throat> the enumeration areas are usually carried over to the agriculture census. Now, for the most part, the enumeration areas are used in the agriculture census are pretty much the same, but sometimes they can be adjusted based on the type of agriculture that's practiced. Um, <clears throat> One thing about agricultural households are agricultural households are usually not located in one spot. Right? So agriculture is a bit tricky in that respect because sometimes you can have plots of land where you're practicing agriculture in a completely different area from where you're actually living. <clears throat> so agricultural sense, it's important to note that sometimes our household may be located across different EAs. <clears throat> but, we, but mostly we're only concerned with the agricultural headquarters or the, the household itself for the, uh, the frame. <clears throat> okay. So once we have a list in the population census, <clears throat> this list transfers over to the agriculture census. Now, it's not always perfect, but we try. We usually <clears throat> try to keep the population census and the agriculture census within a couple of years of each other right? to ensure that our lists are relevant. Lists are really expensive to maintain. Right? <clears throat> and it's a lot of work to make sure that those lists are up to date at all times. Because agricultural censuses, population censuses, they happen not very frequently almost every five to 10 years, depending where you're from. <clears throat> so once we have a list for the agriculture census, <clears throat> agriculture census helps us to build frame items for our subsectors. <clears throat> so we have crops, livestock, fisheries, and forestry, and maybe some other modules as well, looking at food security, labor, <clears throat> and machinery sometimes. And these items go on to help form the frames for our for further surveys in the country, if they are available. <clears throat> right. 
So this is an example of how the data system works in a traditional agricultural statistical system. It's not always flowing as nice as this. Um, most of the time, we see that most of the surveys are a bit ad hoc, right? Because <clears throat> it really comes down to budget. <clears throat> Sometimes we're not able to carry out a statistical activity at a time, and <clears throat> our frames become out of date, and we have to do other means in order to ensure <clears throat> that we can carry out those activities. So agriculture and the statistical system. So like I said in the first day, in the past few years, I've been involved in the development of computer-assisted personal interviewing or tablet applications for agricultural statistics. And one of the main things that we've, <clears throat> the main request we've received through CAPI is integration of GPS coordinates. So these are some examples of how we've incorporated uh, GIS into the different types of statistical activities that we work with. So in the population censuses, we usually support developing an agricultural module. Here we add some agricultural questions that help us form the frame for the agricultural census. But we also include the household GPS coordinates, that is the coordinate of the household at the doorway <clears throat> to help form the linkages between the population census and the agricultural census. <clears throat> In the agricultural census, again, we include the household GPS coordinate, which allows us to link to further surveys if, we are, if they are scheduled. And one of the trickiest parts of an agricultural survey is the location of the parcels and the area measurements if it's required. So as I mentioned, agricultural households are usually spread out across a large area. Uh, in some cases, like in Thailand, we have what we call mobile phone farmers. Right? So the farmers will be living in the city while their parcels of land are located elsewhere in the country. Now, it's not always possible for a numerator to visit an agricultural household and visit all the different parcels. So we usually set some kind of threshold limit saying that if the parcel is with outside the bounds of the EEA or maybe two, three hours from the household, then we will leave that out and just ask for the farmer estimate of where that parcel is located and how big of that area is. <clears throat> Another area where geospatial information is used for the agricultural census is sometimes the addition of photos and videos. Now, you may not know it, but each time you take a photo, there is actually a location associated with that photo in the, in the metadata. And sometimes you can extract that location data to help you verify the location of uh, where that photo was taken. <clears throat> um, other areas of work is the administrative and register data. So here we can form coordination mechanisms with existing systems like the land registry departments. Some countries have farmer registries. And <clears throat> if they are available, some countries even have e-government platforms where data <clears throat> is shared across a common network. Uh, so let's revisit the survey cycle. So Lewis brought this up on the first day. Right? <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a general workflow of how a statistical activity is usually carried out. <clears throat> so first we start with the collection of materials, all the preparation materials <clears throat> that are required to carry out a survey. Then, as we've been doing over the last two days, we look at the delimination of the area to build our frame. A frame can be a list frame or an area frame. <clears throat> And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. And in the next, next section, we're talking about <clears throat> how do we stratify our results. A stratification means that we subdivide the population in order to better <clears throat> identify our units in the population. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about sampling units and sampling selection. So this afternoon, <clears throat> session will be mostly about how do we build an area frame and how do we select units from that area frame for our surveys. 
Okay. And then the remaining parts will be covered in tomorrow and Friday. Where we'll be looking at um, preparing the application for a CAPI and going out to the field to collect geospatial information and then bringing it back here and loading it into QGIS, completing the survey cycle. <laughs> So I mentioned that the first phase of any survey is the collection of the materials. <clears throat> so in agriculture statistics, we've been mainly concerned with the idea of what we call a master sampling frame. Now, you've probably seen this term on the publications that have been sitting on your table for the last two days. A master sample frame is kind of like a, a dream, right? Or not a dream, but an idea that we are striving towards. That is one frame that allows us to collect statistics across all the subsectors. But it's very difficult to maintain a list. <clears throat> so I think it's a list requires many different elements from many different sources. So this diagram shows you <clears throat> the different types of sources that are required to build uh, towards a, a strong and robust frame. <clears throat> so on the left side, we have digitized census enumeration areas. And this is what we've been working on for the last two days. These are the enumeration areas form the basis of almost any statistical activity <clears throat> because they help us to identify the location. Okay. And the other part of it is we usually bring the digitized administrative areas. Um, depending on the country, it could be from another agency or organization. <clears throat> and the third item is sometimes is the <clears throat> use of remote sensed imagery. That is satellite imagery, drone imagery, or any kind of topographical map that's been printed and scanned. So these three things help go on to help inform our frame. Now, we're not only talking about location data in a frame. <clears throat> we also have list data, that is the address or the um, <clears throat> characteristics of each of the households. So we have information that's coming from the population census. The, specifically, we're looking at agricultural households. And this could be a tricky one as well. How do we identify an agricultural household in a population census? Usually, we do this by what is their main economic activity or their main occupation, but it's not always clear. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> we also bring in farm household information from the agricultural census. And if it's available, we bring in, <clears throat> oh, also, sorry, not if it's available, it's a necessary component. So agricultural census, we're not only dealing with households, right? <clears throat> we also have to look at um, <clears throat> more uh, non-household <clears throat> entities. We're looking at uh, nonprofit organization, community groups. So we usually have a register of commercial farms as well in addition to the households themselves. <clears throat> and finally, we have the area frame on which we use to ensure complete coverage of the agricultural census. Now, if we're able to bring all those items together, hopefully we can help form our frame. So let's just review a little bit about what enumeration area is and what are the requirements for enumeration area. So where it's practical, agricultural censuses also rely on the enumeration area defined by the population census. Sometimes you may f find the case where you have to split an EA because agricultural households, the interview times for an agricultural health census can be slightly longer, so you have to adjust for that factor. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the size of the EA really depends on the number of, first, the number of holdings, just like the population census, the distance the numerator has to travel to the holdings, the average time in the interview, and also the length of your enumeration period. That is how long the data collection activity is going to take place. 
And just like the population census, the EA depends on, <coughs> the EA has to be the lowest, delineated within the lowest administrative boundary, has to be a complete subdivision of land, no overlaps, as we talked about yesterday. And it usually doesn't cross urban rural administrative boundaries, but that's not always the case, right? If sometimes we find that administrative boundaries with, that we've been using are out of date and our EAs do not match up or line up directly with our administrative boundaries. So I mentioned there's two types of frames. Right? The first type of frame and traditionally used is called a list frame. Does everyone understand what a list frame is? So a list frame is just a, basically a list of all the, all the households that, you, that an enumerator has to visit during a statistical activity. This is, uh, in layman's terms, we can think of a list frame as kind of like an invitation list. So if I wanted to invite everyone to a party <clears throat> in my area, I have to start making a list of all those people who live in my area. But the problem is that, you know, we're not great at recall, or we have problems in trying to remember all the people who should be invited. So we usually rely on friends of friends to help <clears throat> get the notice out so that <clears throat> we can ensure that everyone is included in our party. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> it's very difficult to sometimes we, we have duplicates in our frame, right? So we invite the same person twice to our party. <clears throat> but this process of building the frame, maintaining the frame, maintaining our list of the people to invite is very expensive. And if it's not expensive, it takes a lot of time and effort to ensure that these lists are, <clears throat> are up to date and are robust. <clears throat> The thing is, the thing we have to remember is that, you know, statistical activities, they happen, they don't happen always back to back. Sometimes there's a gap of one, two, three years. <clears throat> and we have to keep maintaining this list. Every time we start a new statistical activity, we have to go back to the list frame <clears throat> and update these frames, which is a very time consuming process. And that's why it's important like in the first slide, so we move towards an integrated system where everything is lined up in a calendar type system so we can ensure that each time we do a new activity, we can update the list as we go. <clears throat> the second type of frame that we're <clears throat> we've all been working with is called an area frame. On the area frame, <clears throat> is just a list of area units. Now, <clears throat> we can define these, like we've been doing the last two days, as delineating boundaries on a map. This <clears throat> is <clears throat> considered a more, can be considered a more robust way <clears throat> of approaching a list, because area boundaries are less likely to change over time. It's expensive to build in terms of time, but it helps us to maintain a frame over a longer period, maybe between two censuses. <clears throat> so if I wanted to build an area frame for my birthday party, for example, <clears throat> I would probably just <clears throat> make a square around my neighborhood and within that square, I can look at all the household units within that square. <clears throat> and typically, in the agriculture census, we combine the two. We combine both area frames and list frames. So once we have an area frame, like our enumeration areas that we've been building, we do what's called a listing. Uh, the listing, <clears throat> we go to each individual household and we grab some small information to make sure that they are, in fact, an agricultural household. In some countries, we even put a sticker on the door with a household serial number to show the enumerator said this household should be counted in the agricultural census. 
Uh, so let's take a break here. Um, <clears throat> just go around the room if we <clears throat> can. Talk about the different types of maps that are used for statistical activities. Um, <clears throat> who are the involved agencies <clears throat> who are involved in maintaining the map products? How do you share these map products across your country? Um, do you collect geospatial information in your s current census and surveys? Do you plan to? And what are some of the issues that you've had along the way? Anyone want to? So said next session we'll be looking at some kind, looking at remote sensing. So remote sensing deals with looking at things from afar. It doesn't have to be exactly satellite imagery. Uh, we can be, there's also other types of aerial photography, such as taking pictures from a plane, or more recently we're using the uh, drones to collect these information, these kinds of images and information. So we'll be going through the different types of it, in, um, imagery that's available out there, uh, mostly looking at free sources, uh, but <clears throat> And we'll have some uh, hands-on time uh, to look at these satellite imagery and to what extent we can use them. So the most frequent type of satellite imagery that you usually see, like the ones we see through Google Earth or Google Maps, are optical images. That is, the op images that look like what we can see. So they are true to the colors that we see in everyday life. So if I look at a tree in the satellite image, it is a pretty good chance that it's going to be green, depending on the season. Okay. <clears throat> and optical images also include light that we cannot see. So the, some, <clears throat> some satellite imagers have different bands that we can look at in different wavelengths. So light, or satellite imagery, or any type of image, is just a reflection of light. Right? It's just the colors that we see when we are looking at something is just a different reflection of light back to us. So if I look at a tree, <clears throat> that light is reflecting off that tree shows me a green color. <clears throat> and not all colors are visible to us. So we have uh, <clears throat> light at different wavelengths um, and we have different scientific sensors that are able to collect those types of light. So we're, that, those types of light also help us to uh, look at different aspects or different information <coughs> from satellite imagery. Okay. Um, so satellite imagery, um, they come in a wide variety of resolutions. What is resolution? We typically measure resolution in terms of pixels. So if you stare at your screen really, really closely, you'll see one little dot on your screen. That's called a pixel. And a pixel, <clears throat> will, in a satellite imagery, will <clears throat> correspond to a certain distance or square area. So a pixel may refer to um, 30 centimeters if you have very high resolution, or it can represent up to three meters, right? And, it, and so on and so forth, including up to square, large square kilometers. Uh, satellite imagery can be quite expensive if it's a programmed acquisition. What does programmed acquisition mean? So if you are engaging a satellite image provider, if you tell them that you need a satellite image from a particular time period, it'll, it can be quite costly because they have to reorient their satellite in order to capture the image that you need. Now, <clears throat> It's sometimes this is important in agriculture because we are very sensitive to time. Because in agriculture, land changes quite a bit depending on the season the image is captured. Right? So in one part of the year, you can have a plot that's clearly visible. A few months later, that plot is completely covered and it's not visible by satellite. <clears throat> so it's very important sometimes in agricultural statistics, depending on what you want to do, is to have multiple images across the year to see how the land changes, depending on the types of crops grown or uh, changes in land cover. <clears throat> okay. That being said, 
There's a lot of free satellite imagery out there and more growing every day, even very high resolution imagery. <clears throat> so you have um, <clears throat> the most common ones that we all see is satellite imagery that's being available through Google Earth or Bing Maps, right? There's some limitations to this, particularly in the context of agriculture, is because while Google Earth has very nice high resolution imagery, those images are composite images. So we're, you're not always quite sure at what time that image was captured. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the other issue is that a lot of the times when you do capture satellite imagery, you have clouds blocking most of your image. It's, <clears throat> and what Google Earth and Bing Maps do is they combine those maps so that they can remove the cloud cover so you can get that clear image of seeing the top-down view of everything <clears throat> in view. So it's not a true image exactly of what is going on. <clears throat> okay. okay. However, that being said, um, you can still use old images uh, to build a sampling frame. If all you're looking at is just the general structure of <clears throat> maybe you're just looking for what different types of land use classifications, such as agricultural land, uh, forest land, or urban buildup. <clears throat> okay. So you can get a general idea of what those items are from a typical, from a um, satellite image, regardless of time. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And a typical image, um, if you, it depends on where you purchase it from, what the provider is, what the satellite is. Um, one's images come in what they call swaths. Right? It could be a square, it can be a long rectangle, but most of these swaths will cover about 200 to 1,000 square meters. Okay. All right. So this is an example of the high-resolution imagery. So this is a commercial uh, image provided by a company called Planet Labs. Uh, this is, they, ha they have what is a program called Skybox for Good. And this, they provide very high resolution imagery uh, for, I think it was in 2016. And so you can see in this image with the very, I think this is about, I can't remember exactly the resolution, but it's sub-meter resolution. So in this kind of image, you can start to see very uh, small details. Like you can start to make out the roofs of the houses. You can make out roads. Um, in some cases, you can make out fences. <clears throat> and very, very fine details. And <clears throat> actually, one of the um, nice research areas that is ongoing is that <clears throat> uh, people are starting to use computer algorithms to identify rooftops <laughs> of houses using these images uh, to help inform their population census. <clears throat> but that's very much research at this point, I think. Okay, but very high resolution images like that can be costly. Right? <clears throat> Those require um, engagement with commercial satellite providers. Um, <clears throat> but there are a number of sources that are quite good already and are available for free <clears throat> from a number of providers, including um, the United States, NASA program, uh, in the European Union, we have ESA, the European Space Agency, that provides very nice imagery as well. Okay. So medium to coarse resolution. Um, <clears throat> these images for one pixel ranges between 10 and 30 meters resolution. Uh, the most popular in this category are what's called Landsat images, Landsat 8. It's from the U.S. and Sentinel. Um, Sentinel has one, two, and three satellites uh, that have slightly different purposes depending on uh, which uh, application you're looking to use it for. <clears throat> um, each image covers about 30 to 80,000 square meters, so it's very um, a large area, and we'll see the image in a second. 
And the thing about free is that the satellites are constantly rotating around the world. Right? And they're capturing images <coughs> throughout the day. <coughs> but they're only able to capture <coughs> images at one point. <coughs> um, so uh, for something like Landsat and Sentinel, we're only looking at about uh, six images of a particular point uh, per month. And the issues with some of the issues that you'll encounter in looking at this data is that there's a lot of cloud cover. So you, for the, a lot of the lands that you look at a particular <coughs> image, you, <coughs> uh, depending on the time of the year it was taken, you'll see a lot of cloud cover and you won't be able to make out some of the geographical features. <coughs> Okay. So again, assuming we have clear skies, and <clears throat> lastly, we have uh, coarse resolution. Coarse resolution is one pixel is <clears throat> approximately is larger than about 250 uh, meters, <clears throat> and <clears throat> so for this one, with coarse imagery, we're able to cover a larger area per day. So we're able so. <clears throat> The most popular um, satellite for coarse resolution is a satellite called MODIS. And MODIS <coughs> uh, <coughs> provides us um, okay, about 10 images. And we're able, because we're able to capture more images, we're a, we can composite them uh, to take out the clouds. <coughs> And it gives us a general view of some of the vegetation that's grown. And we'll see it in a second. OK. So this is an image of, from the Landsat uh, satellite. So you can see it's a pretty nice detail here. It's not as high detail as the image we were looking at earlier. But from, from this image, we can get a pretty good detail of uh, what areas are built, our forest area, which areas have uh, urban buildup. <coughs> And in some cases, we can actually zoom in and we start to see uh, individual households and some plot areas if they're relatively big. <clears throat> okay. This is an image from the other satellite. It's called Sentinel-2. It's slightly higher resolution, uh, but more or less these two um, are, the <clears throat> are in the same range of um, clarity, I would say. Um, <clears throat> we have a slightly different color correction. Uh, this one is a bit more bluish. But um, again, you can pretty, see pretty clearly from this image what you have the urban buildup. And you can see the, uh, the, the individual islands across um, the area that we're looking at. OK. And this is MODIS. So like I said, MODIS is the most coarse of the resolution. Um, you can't see much in terms of defined uh, land areas, but it's still pretty useful for us, right? Because we can start, we can still see which areas are land, which areas could be sea, but there are other issues, right? We're, for the, some of the smaller islands, they've been completely missed, <laughs> or it's not very clear. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a bit hard to see on the presentation screen, but if you look at it on the computer, you do see that the smaller islands are represented by a uh, slightly, um, what is it, um, d yeah, one square or very muted colors compared to the sea. Okay. So why is this kind of image useful for us? Like I said, we have multiple images. When we have a low resolution, we're able to cover more area. And we're also able to capture more of that image across time. So we can combine these images to eliminate cloud cover. And it allows us to do fun things like doing l derived land cover maps. Right? <clears throat> so this is a image. That what this image is representing is a a probability that uh, that particular image has a certain land cover. 
<clears throat> so this is a done by a computer algorithm, basically saying that this pixel with this color value has a pretty good likelihood that it is urban buildup, cropland, or vegetation. <clears throat> right. It's not always perfect, but it does give us a pretty good idea as to what are the different land covers used in the country. <clears throat> and we can use this in our area frames so that we can help identify which areas we should be conducting an agricultural set, um, survey. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The last type of imagery is called SAR. So SAR is actually not an optical image. SAR is called Synthetic Aperture Radar. So it's a radar image. <clears throat> a radar image is basically measures the reflectance of light. So the satellite will send a small laser to the point we're interested in, and we measure how much is reflected back. And that helps us to form kind of <clears throat> the image of a particular area. The advantage of this is that we're able to see through clouds. So cloud cover is not really an issue. And this is pretty important in tropical countries because we have cloud cover for most of the year. <clears throat> right. In Thailand, we have two rain seasons. <laughs> okay. And it's also particularly nice because the reflectance value that we get back is pretty sensitive to vegetation and soil mo moisture. So one of the most common uses of this satellite imagery is actually to identify rice paddies. Right? Because, <clears throat> because we have a pr there's a very good sensitivity, by sending the la laser to that point and measuring that reflectance value, it has kind of like a signature or a fingerprint showing that you know, a rice at this particular uh, point in time has a pretty good likelihood that will be represented by a certain signature of light. <clears throat> like I said, it's very good to identify rice. Um, but it's also noisier than optical images, right? So the light, ref so when that light reflects off a particular crop, um, that th the reflected value that we receive back is not always in a clear-cut manner. So if I point the laser at rice, I'm not always going to get back the same number. Sometimes I get back a range of values, and that range of values is can be difficult for us in identifying different types <clears throat> of vegetation. But you'll see very soon that SAR imagery is quite um, high detail because of the radar images. So we, here is a, um, a SAR image of Fiji where we can see very nice topographical features um, across the country in pretty good detail. <clears throat> and this is um, fed from a satellite called Sentinel-1. And this is also freely available online. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so like I said, remote sensing is not only satellite imagery. The other more, um, I think an area that's gaining pretty good popularity right now <coughs> is using drone imagery. Uh, so this <clears throat> drone imagery allows us to capture images at up to centimeter grade resolution. So one pixel is equal to one centimeter on the ground. So this gets into some pretty scary territory. Where we're able to zoom in really, really closely to <clears throat> points on the ground. Um, so in some cases, um, some use cases of drone imagery has been to verify physical borders, boundaries. Uh, so what some countries do, for example, in land area measurement, uh, they will um, take a satellite imagery, usually of medium resolution, and try to outline all the plot boundaries of an agricultural household. Uh, in, under normal practice, 
they'll do a field survey. They'll go to each of those plots and try to determine what crops are grown on that plot or whether the plot boundaries that they made using the satellite imagery is correct or not. But that's very expensive to do. So what, one thing the drones have been able to do is we've been able to send the drone out to that area where we drew the plot boundaries and we, tr to, uh, and we can use that uh, high resolution image to ensure that the boundaries that we drew are in fact correct. We can also look at the particular crop that's grown <clears throat> because we have such high resolution imagery. And we can also do some scientific analysis, which is really cool, is looking at soil moisture, crop health monitoring, and whether those crops um, have exposure to some irrigation. But the problem is using drones right now is quite expensive. Right? We need a lot of, you need a big team to, to take a drone to the field. You don't need, not just the pilot, you probably need a, um, a person who will spot the plane in case anything goes wrong. You need spotters throughout the field to, to know where the drone is at all times. <clears throat> and biggest, one of the other biggest problems we have right now is the battery life is limited. So <clears throat> in this image, we're using a commercial uh, DGI drone. And we have a battery life of about 20 minutes per flight. Right? And we can cover about, usually about a square kilometer uh, before the battery dies. Problem is when we go out to the field, we need to be <coughs> capturing images throughout the field in order to <coughs> make the best use of our time. So we have to carry multiple battery packs. <coughs> and the multiple battery packs adds on to cost. Now, <coughs> the other issue is transport cost. So this is a relatively small drone that you can carry on a plane. But if you have, there is also larger drones. We call them fixed wing drones. They're basically mini airplanes. And to transport those kind of drones, you need large pickup trucks with multiple uh, people to carry them. And the last concern is that there are privacy concerns, right? If we can zoom in to centimeter level um, <clears throat> resolution, uh, you can, we can start looking into people's backyards. We can read license plates on cars. <laughs> so um, in some countries, they actually have what they call anti-drone systems. So these are located on military institutions that if they detect some kind of <clears throat> um, unmanned aerial vehicle or drone coming into their airspace, they have the right to shoot it down. <laughs> so. When you start using drones, one of the most important steps is actually engaging your aviation ministries or departments because you have to let them know what you're doing in the exercise. Otherwise, you're going to be <laughs> your drone may be shot down or it can be blocked by a signal and you can lose it forever. <laughs> okay. So this is an example of a, um, a field survey that we did. Uh, earlier this year. So we took a, about a one kilometer uh, sample image. And you can see here on the right side is the zoomed in part of the image. <clears throat> uh, so this is just a one, I think it's a palm tree. And with this kind of resolution, you can start to see individual leaves on the plant. And this is uh, very nice if you're looking at crop health. So you can if you have an area where uh, there's maybe a disease outbreak, you can start to see some of these, um, the signs of disease outbreak on the individual leaves or the tree trunks. And you can also see that uh, this, is, this image was taken during the dry season, but you can start to see some of the plot outlines of each of the different plots in the area. Um, the other thing about this particular plot, it was used to grow um, sort of more uh, vegetation type crops looking at, or year round type crops. So <clears throat> during the dry season, these um, types of areas tend to be left uh, fallow or unused. 
So that's why you see that it's mostly empty, but they are, in fact, agricultural land. <clears throat> so it's very important to look at when you are taking the image when it comes to agriculture. Okay. <clears throat> so what are some of the uses for satellite imagery? The first one, of course, is to use it to support um, your statistical activity in visiting the actual plot that you're interested. So here we have a, <clears throat> a relatively um, high resolution image of 2.5. Uh, here, the enumerator from this image can make out the roads to, um, and the major landmarks in which they have to survey. Okay. The other more, uh, another popular area the satellite image is used for is area measurement. <clears throat> so if you have pretty high resolution imagery, um, what some countries have done is they download the image and they just sit at the computer and start making outlines around the plot, just as we've done the past two days. Uh, of course, this is very resource intensive to actually make a complete coverage of a country. <clears throat> And it, these plot boundaries are not always consistent over time. So it's, it requires a lot of effort to make sure that these are up to date. <clears throat> so here on the image on the left, we're using um, very high resolution imagery of about 0.6 <clears throat> meters per square p um, per pixel. So here we can clearly <clears throat> see the boundaries around each of the individual plots. But um, said area measurement requires pretty high resolution image. So if we just zoom out a little bit to an image with slightly lower resolution, we can already start to see that our plot boundaries are starting to disappear. <clears throat> so here in our second image, where the, we have a lower resolution, while the first plot is more or less um, similar to our first image, our second plot is completely missing. And there is no real way to <clears throat> interpret from this photo alone whether this is a plot or not. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> the biggest problem with satellite imagery is how do we acquire it? <clears throat> it's one of these images is a very large file. If you tried to go on the, um, I guess, a website like USGS, which is the US Geological Survey, one image is probably going to be around close to one gigabyte per image. And you're probably looking at a larger area that requires multiple images. So if you want to capture one image at one point in time, you're probably looking at a file between four and five gigabytes. That's very, very difficult if your internet connection is not great. <clears throat> so one thing Google has been able to do is they've been able to integrate all these images on one platform that doesn't require you to download the images at every time. Right? <clears throat> so they have a product called the Google Earth Engine. It's very similar to Google Earth, but you can actually specify what image you want to look at and at what time. <clears throat> so for the next, uh, I guess, until lunchtime, I'd just like to <clears throat> give you the chance to go to the website and just explore the different uh, types of imagery that are available. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so this is the link. Uh, if you have access to the internet, it's the URL is pretty basic. It's earthengine.google.com. Uh, you may need to sign in, but <clears throat> yeah. Hmm. But hmm. so I tried it last night, and it didn't require me to sign in. But let's. Tr Let's try going to the website and just scrolling through what is available. OK. 
So <clears throat> Google Earth Engine is not just a repository of images, right? It's actually an analysis platform. So you can do a lot of the remote sensing type analysis on the website itself. Everything is cloud-based. You don't need to download the images at all. Although you could download the images, uh, there is a plugin available for QGIS that allows you to connect QGIS to this, uh, the Google Earth engine. <clears throat> okay. So th to access this data, uh, we can just go all to the very top of the page and click on data sets. Let's see how long this takes to load. <laughs> okay. So as we scroll down through the page, we'll get different types of data. Um, there should be pictures associated with each data set, but I think it's still loading. So you'll have different types of satellite imagery. Here we can look at <clears throat> uh, surface temperature, satellite imagery, we can look at climate imagery. Um, atmospheric, weather. But if we scroll down to imagery section, <clears throat> we can start to see, um, look for Landsat data, Sentinel data, MODIS, and in some cases they even have very high resolution imagery available for some countries that have contributed to the platform. <clears throat> okay. So let's try going to look at Landsat data. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So Landsat is divided into what they call missions. And each mission has slightly different sensors depending on what that that satellite was used um, was intended for. <clears throat> okay. So each satellite will have different sense of sensors that it captures different types of what they call bands or information or um, at different wavelengths. Okay. Each of these missions also have slightly different resolutions. The latest mission of Landsat is Landsat 8, which has been running between 2013 and the present. So let's take a look at Landsat 8. Let's, we can just click on that, the first box. <clears throat> and you'll see we have three options. Uh, the one on the far right is the raw image that's taken directly from the satellite. And we also have two other <clears throat> uh, options. These are slightly color corrected uh, to help us improve the vis visibility of the objects on the image. Uh, so let's take a look at the um, surface reflectance. Okay, all right. Uh, th this leads you to a metadata page that gives you some information about the, d the data that is available for Landsat 8. Uh, some more technical specifications, including what bands of <coughs> the image is being captured at, and <coughs> uh, some of the image properties. Okay. The way we can get to the satellite imagery, we can just scroll down to the bottom. So like I said, Google Earth Engine is kind of like a developer platform. So you'll see some coding. <clears throat> uh, this code you can incorporate into other applications or websites in order to access this data. But for the purposes of this training, we won't be uh, looking at that. So what we can do for our purpose is just click on Open in Code Editor. Okay. And it does require me to log in. So let's, I will log into my account. And I didn't remember my password correctly. <laughs> and security is always good. 
So if you can <coughs> implement two-factor authentication, it's always good practice. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So this is the Google Earth Engine platform. <clears throat> and the first, you're first presented with just a normal Google Maps base map. Right. <clears throat> How do we get to the satellite image? So, like I said, this is a developer platform. So we have to run a bit of code. And the way we do that is we click the Run button at the top. <clears throat> you can see the image from Landsat starts loading in swaths. Okay. But let's say we're not really interested in this area. So we can actually go to the search bar at the top and click in the area that we are interested. So since we're in Numia, let's type in Numia. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. So just like the image I showed you, uh, <clears throat> we can now interact with our data. We can just pan through the image. And we can also zoom in to the image. Um, but as you note, as you zoom in, it does require a refresh of the internet, so it may take some time to load. <clears throat> but you start to get a pretty good idea of what this image is capable of, what kind of features you can make out of it. <clears throat> so as you see, as we zoom in, yeah, the image is a little bit coarse. <clears throat> but if we zoom out, As we zoom out, we're able to see uh, the image across a larger area, and we have a pretty good idea of which area has forest cover, which areas have urban build out, <clears throat> and areas that have some kind of cropland. Hmm. So now I'm going to give you the opportunity just to explore the, this data set. Um, we just try to have a look at it, see what kind of features that you can interpret from them. And if you want to switch between different types of satellites, uh, you can always go back to the, um, the main Google Earth Engine page and click through the different available um, data sets that are available. So now we can see our main page. The <clears throat> The images are starting to load again. <clears throat> so here we have, you can look through the Landsat data set, um, images available from Sentinel, um, some of the, uh, the data from MODIS, and also some of the, the very high resolution imagery that's available for certain countries. You can also look at land cover maps. <clears throat> uh, these are land maps that are sometimes uploaded by individual countries to the platform. And there's also some countries who produce cropland maps. So these are maps where specific crops are delineated on the map itself. Another popular area where remote sensing is used is looking at um, nighttime imagery. So this is beginning to be used in things like the population census to help identify urban centers or where people are living, right? Because at night, people tend to turn on light or use some kind of traditional light. And these light images are if, can be captured by satellite imagery. And <clears throat> some of the use cases for this is not only to identify the population, but some researchers are taking it a bit step further and looking at things like poverty analysis, like how much of the <clears throat> urban centers are covered by light. <clears throat> okay, So I'll give you some time to just scroll through these data sets and just um, become more familiar with what is available for free, really.
All right. So how did everyone like the, um, the satellite imagery? It's easy to use. Um, yeah. And what did you think about the quality of the, the satellite imagery that's available online? You think that this kind of imagery would be useful for, say, let's building an EA framework or identifying sampling units? It's clear enough to understand, say, <coughs> Uh, capturing a household unit or uh, possibly looking at individual agricultural plots. Okay. Well, as with everything, there's a lot of limitations to satellite imagery, right? <clears throat> and the biggest one for agricultural statistics is that our land uses, how we use land for agriculture, are different over the course of one year. We have different seasons. We have different types of harvest, when times when uh, plants are sowed. Mm -hmm. And you have plants of different lengths and periods. Some, we have plants that are, have a growing period of, say, two weeks for some small vegetation, like um, cabbages or tomatoes. And you can have long crops that last several decades, like looking at orchards, for example, apple trees, uh, mango trees. <clears throat> so these kind of crops will show up differently depending on at what time you are looking at your satellite imagery. So one of the starting points is looking at what imagery do I need? You should go to your crop calendar. So this image here on the left is a it's crop calendar for rice. Uh, across a number of different countries. And you can see it's broken down into two colors. So the green shows the planting seasons, and the <coughs> orange or yellow shows the harvest. <coughs> so <coughs> usually when we're looking at satellite imagery for these kind of products, we typically try to look at images before, during, and after uh, the season, the harvesting season because we want to understand the extent and how um, the crop evolves on the, um, a particular location over the course of a season. <clears throat> the other limitation for satellite imagery is because when you're looking down on an image, sometimes you cannot see the actual agricultural activity. Uh, one case of this is look is agricultural activity that happens in forest under forest cover uh, so in in agriculture you can have an agriculture activity such as collection from forest which is uh, collecting uh, things like mushrooms or uh, roots that grow inside the forest and there's also crops that are grown in under forest cover so you have things like coffee so coffee is typically grown in a forest environment uh, in a more rural area where it <clears throat> uh, may not be commercialized. <clears throat> so these kind of crops are sometimes a bit more difficult to identify just by looking at the satellite imagery itself. <clears throat> okay. All right. All right. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here, right? So let's think about what are the objectives of a census. The first objective of a census is to build your baseline data about, let's say for an agricultural census, baseline data for agricultural sector. <clears throat> but the most important, or probably one of the most important aspects of a census is to build a frame for which all of your other statistical activities will be built on. <clears throat> So a large part of the agriculture census is learning how we can develop that frame <clears throat> so that we can build other statistical activities for it. <clears throat> and once we have that frame, we have to understand how we can select units from that frame. And there's different types of units we can select from the frame. We, in agriculture census, in agricultural statistics, we're not, sometimes we may not be concerned with just selecting that particular household. We may be concerned with just selecting a point on some land mass or in some area. We may be concerned by collecting a strip of land 
which we call a transect. And we also may be concerned with collecting samples from a small area. Uh, the area can be a physical boundary, such as like a smaller sampling unit, like we worked on yesterday. Or it can be like a grid. Right? So we can define a grid on the map and select a box from that grid for further investigation. <clears throat> so the main uh, objective of our session this afternoon is how do we collect these different types of points using QGIS. So this is an example of a point sampling frame uh, from Tanzania. So we have two things going on here. First, the base map. The base map is a land cover map that's derived from satellite imagery and also uh, national land cover surveys. And you can see we have the land mass is categorized into a number of categories, looking at cropland, forest land, grassland, uh, settlements, urban build out, and also wetlands. So this helps us to stratify our frame, that is to break down the frame into different categories so that we can better target our sample for those specific types of households. <clears throat> In a point sampling frame, we're basically dropping one dimensionless plot or uh, point into different areas. <clears throat> and here, the points are stratified based on where that point is located within the land use <clears throat> uh, base map. So if a point is dropped into the green area, we know that that household <clears throat> is probably conducts maybe with some probability, conducts some forestry activities. If it falls into a <clears throat> uh, pink or green area, uh, there's some probability that they can be involved in either crop activities, or in the case of grasslands, they may be involved in grazing livestock and such. And we'll be going over some examples later this afternoon about how we drop these points onto a map. Okay. So, so what are the, some of the use cases for point sampling? Okay. <clears throat> so a reporting unit is a dimensionless plot, a point. Right? There, <clears throat> when we drop the point on the map, we have one GPS coordinate. We have the latitude and the longitude. And what we're telling the numerator is, they want, we want them to travel to that particular point on the map and observe what is at that point. <clears throat> so what can they observe? They can observe the crop area, if there is crop on that point. What is the yield of the crop? So they can perform what is called a crop yield survey, where they'll typically um, delineate a small area and cut the crop and weigh it <clears throat> to get a good idea of how much, uh, what is the yield of that crop per uh, small area. They can look at, is irrigation present on that point? They can also look at some landscape features. What is the land cover? Is it agricultural land? Is it forest land? <clears throat> this is very helpful if you want to develop something like a land cover map, which we saw in the last slide. Okay. Say if sometimes we're not considered with a particular point, we want to identify farms within an area of that point. <clears throat> so we can look at all the agricultural activity of the farm that's associated with that single point within some buffer area. We can also look at households. Right. <clears throat> so we can link that point to all the different households <clears throat> and collect some kind of socioeconomic data from them. Okay. But the problem with agricultural households is that if you draw one point onto a map, 
it's very possible that you can encounter many households. Right? But the reverse is also true. <clears throat> there can be, <clears throat> you can have multiple points dropped onto the map, but you can only be covering one agricultural household or one commercial farm. So this is some of the issues that we find when doing point sampling frames. <clears throat> OK. All right. So that's one type of way where you can select samples from an area frame. The next one, which we've kind of built up to in yesterday's session, is the use of physical segments for selection. <clears throat> so both of these images are <clears throat> show two EA areas. The first EA area on the left is basically just an EA area that's been subdivided into different smaller segments. And we did a little bit of this yesterday's <clears throat> session where we tried to minimize to specify that each individual segment within the EA should be have a certain number of households. Um, in statistics, we call these um, sampling units, basically. <clears throat> okay. And you can define these sampling units through QGIS, as we've done yesterday. <clears throat> and we can select these segments <clears throat> for further investigation in our surveys. So how do we use these segments? Or some, what are the, some of the use cases for having a physical segment? <clears throat> we can, we get, it allows us to better define the strata or what kind of <clears throat> land type this is associated with, the land use. It allows us to digitize on a map the primary sampling unit. That is the this, uh, this smaller sampling unit within the EA. <clears throat> But one of the issues with this is how do we interpret what is on a particular segment? So there's a large amount of work that goes into uh, verifying at that particular segment whether it is truly a piece of land that's used for agriculture. And if it's used for agriculture, what crops are grown on it? Because right? I mentioned agriculture, over the course of a year, a, land, a piece of land can be used for multiple purposes. <clears throat> So we have to look at different points in time to see how, what are the different land use categories. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And of course, we do some uh, checks to see whether a <clears throat> have to understand what is the relationship between the sampling unit and the strata, which is um, what characteristic that uh, segment is associated with. So are they associated with a particular crop type? Are they associated with a different, re with a particular region or location? These, all these types of attributes about that location help to inform how we do our sample. Okay. So these are just some examples of different, again, um, area, uh, enumeration areas that are sub further subdivided into smaller uh, sampling units. Again, at this point, I think we're all pretty confident in our ability to be able to <coughs> delineate these boundaries. Okay. Now, so we've, so far, we've covered two types of sampling. We've covered sampling by points and by segments. So what happens if we don't have the segments readily available with us, right? Because building these segments is time consuming. It's expensive to do. So one of the things we can do is we can define an area frame by grids, regularly sized grids. And we'll do this a bit later will show you how to overlay a grid over a particular area, and then how to select individual grids 
from that frame. <clears throat> okay. So these are just some examples of how an area, of <clears throat> uh, a grid sample is taken, usually. But even with a grid sample, we can have multiple levels of sampling points, right? So we can have a grid at the first level, and then we can further specify points within that grid on a second level. Uh, in statistics, we call this a multi-level <coughs> sampling. So our first point, so the grid is our first <coughs> level of selection. So we, we take the area frame, we put, overlay the grid, and we select a grid from that area frame. Within that area frame, we're also looking to select, we may be um, interested in further selecting a point from within that grid. So here, we can further drop points into that particular grid to make a further selection. And these are two types of way, uh, examples. So in the first one, we have the grid sample as our first stage. And in the second stage, we drop equidistant points for a second stage of selection. In the second example, we basically have the first stage is a physical segment. Right? This is a, um, a defined um, physical boundary. And within that physical boundary, we are dropping a grid. and selecting units from that grid. Okay. So we have, so now in our toolbox, we have points, we have physical boundaries, we have grids. And there's one other one, which we call a transect. So a transect is like a grid, but it's a long strip of land. Now, it's, this has limited, more limited use cases, and the main use cases here are for <clears throat> things like livestock. So we may have uh, nomadic livestock, which are traveling along a long uh, pasture area or walking maybe down a road. So <clears throat> when we are looking, when we are taking our sample from that unit, we want to ensure that uh, that maybe one particular animal is only counted once. Because if we have, maybe if we're looking at a long strip of land, right? <clears throat> Over time, the animal will just keep walking along that strip of land. And if we take multiple images, that animal may show up multiple times along that road. So if we take our sampling unit across a long transect, we, we can have a with some degree of probability that <clears throat> the animals that in, are counted there are only counted once. Uh, transects are also very nice if you're using uh, drones or uh, aerial photography because typically it's very, if you're using a large drone, like a fixed wing drone here, uh, <clears throat> the, it's very difficult for them to turn. Right? So usually, when we send the drone up, it flies in one straight direction. And that becomes our sampling unit. OK? Like I mentioned, this is an example of uh, a sampling transect for uh, live, nomadic livestock. So nomadic livestock is actually a very interesting area because these are livestock that have no physical are not within any physical borders. Right? <clears throat> They're usually um, herded along by uh, herders <clears throat> over large areas. We don't have a particular household that we can associate them by. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so let's, um, I don't know if. We can take a break here and just um, maybe discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages of each method. Um, what, 
what are the current practices, maybe in some of your countries, of, where, of how you select um, sample units from an area frame? Or even if you do use an area frame at all to uh, collect statistics, right? So there's many ways an area frame can be used for a survey. The most typical way is we select an enumeration area from an area frame. Within that area frame, we usually combine it with a list frame. Right? So we, for that particular area, we'll go visit all the households and make a list of all the households that are in that particular enumeration area. <clears throat> and we'll select those households for a survey um, depending on how the me your survey methodology whether you want to do a random sample, you want to do a systematic sample, <clears throat> you know, the choices are uh, quite uh, robust or significant. Um, so maybe we can just ask, start with a simple question. Does anyone use an area frame for sampling? <clears throat> so in our next module, <clears throat> we're going to be, we're going to have a, maybe like a hands-on session about how to do each of these sampling units. Mm -hmm. So all the information from the slide and a lot more that I wasn't able to cover is available in our publication <coughs> on the handbook on remote sensing for agricultural statistics. Uh, we also have a separate publication that's also running around called the uh, Handbook for the Master Sampling Frame which discusses a little bit more about the different types of uh, area sampling units. Okay, Some other remote sensing publications just to share with you for future reference. So a lot of the uh, remote sensing area work that we do is really in crop yields. Uh, it's one of the <coughs> leading areas of research for the use of satellite imagery. Uh, <coughs> Because uh, what we're trying to do right now is to make the linkage between um, the geo coordinates from censuses and surveys and linking it with uh, satellite imagery and trying to merge the two to see if we can find a better way to uh, accurately predict crop yields. So we have a number of different exercises that we'll work through uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first exercise. We're just going to do something very basic that we've done a number of times already throughout this week. Is we're going to load our um, <clears throat> our admin, our EA framework, and our base map. So if you go to our to the USB key yeah, under the folder layers, we'll have the EA boundaries for Vanuatu, and also <clears throat> yeah. So let's uh, go ahead and load that into QGIS. So the first thing we're going to do, that we've done quite a few times already, is to load our enumeration area boundaries into QGIS. Um, I'm just going to drag this directly into the window. <coughs> yeah. And the second thing I'm going to do is to load the base map. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. And here I'm just going to do a few preparatory things. I'm just going to reorder the layers to have the, the boundaries on top and do some stylistic changes. All right. Style. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Oops. Okay. I assume everyone can follow me on that one at least. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So once we've established our our framework for um, 
this afternoon's session. So for all the exercises that we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to use the, the EA boundaries for Vanuatu, and we're going to have, use, also use the base map. Uh, later, we'll bring in the household locations, but for now, let's just look at the EA boundaries. <clears throat> okay. So, our next step is how do we select physical boundaries on a map? Now, there are a number of tools to do this. The main, all the tool, almost all of the tools that we'll be working with this afternoon are available under the vector menu. <clears throat> okay. uh, under vector, we'll go to research tools. And here you have a number of different ways that we can select items um, or boundaries in QGIS. So the first way we're going to do is we're going to do a random selection of our EEA boundaries. For this, we're going to use a tool called random selection. Okay. So if you click random selection, you'll have a nice little pop-up box that comes up. On the right, you can always read some of the documentation that's relevant to this particular function. <clears throat> and we have a number of parameters on the left side of our window. So the first in parameter that we're able to change for this function is our input layer. This is where we want to tell QGIS what boundaries we want to select. Right? <clears throat> This is pretty easy right now because we only have one set of boundaries. <clears throat> but typically here, you will want to select um, <clears throat> the, the layer that includes the, your physical boundaries for selection. So we'll click on uh, Van EA's 4326. <clears throat> Let's continue walking through the different parameters that we can check in the random selection um, function. The second parameter that we can change is the method of selection. Here we have two different methods of selection. We can specify the number of boundaries to be selected, or we can take a percentage of the boundaries to be selected. So the first thing we're going to try is going to try to do the number of selected features. So let's click on that. And then this, the last box of this function, we can specify the number to be selected. So for our example, for the tutorial, let's select 10. Okay. That completes all the parameters that are required for this particular function. So let's click Run. So after this number 10, we see Yes, so you click Run, and now on our um, EA map, we'll see that we'll have 10 physical segments that have been selected. And you can tell they've been selected because they've turned yellow. So one thing we have to be careful about is the, the selected features will change every time we run this particular function, right? So in order to save these selected physical segments, we can go to our layer panel, select our EA boundary layer, and right click. <clears throat> and we're going to select Save As. Okay. Now there's a few different formats in how you can save your selection. But for this particular example, because we're saving physical boundaries, we're going to select the ESRI shape file. Okay. Okay. Let's choose a folder where we're going to save our <coughs> um, selection. 
So let's do this. Okay. So let's create a new folder for where we're going to put our, all of our selections that we're going to do t this afternoon. <clears throat> so let's, I'll make a folder called module three um, selections. Okay. And then I'll save our selection. So let's call this um, exercise one um, EA boundary select and we can include the number of selected and do 10 and as according to good practice that we've been doing for the last couple of days let's add on the projection And we'll click Save. OK. Now, the most important thing when saving your selection layer, make sure that you select this Save Only Selected Features option. If you don't select that, you're going to have the whole EA framework. <clears throat> and the second thing that we want to do is we're going to add that saved file to our map so that we can look at it in QGIS. So before I click OK, I'm just going to mention it again. We should have the save only selected features selected. And for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, we're going to select add saved file to map. OK. And then we're done. We're going to click OK. All right. So now, in QGIS, we now have an additional layer because we've saved that selection layer to our project. <clears throat> so as you can see, if we turn off the view of our enumeration area, we now have our selected areas <clears throat> still there on the map. Another point we should probably emphasize it is that we can do this with any physical segments, right? It doesn't have to be just the EA level. So we can just as easily have the boundaries for our sampling units <clears throat> um, loaded into QGIS and make a selection from that. So I'm going to turn off the layer view for our first selection. And we're going to rerun this process again using a different method. <clears throat> So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deselect <clears throat> our selection by clicking on um, this yellow box with a small red icon in the lower right corner. <clears throat> and we're going to rerun this process using a different method. So in our first method, we selected based on the number of boundaries we want. In the second method, we're going to select based on the percentage. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to go back to our vector menu. We're going to go to <clears throat> research. And we're going to go to random selection again. Okay. So in our input layer, now we have to be a bit careful here, right? Because now we have two shapefile layers. But we want to make our selection from our EA boundaries. So make sure we select EA than EAs. So in our first example, our method was to select based on a specific whole number or integer. In the second way we're going to do it is we're going to select based on a percentage of the physical segments. So the way we do that is we select our method and we can click percentage of selected features. And we can specify that percentage in our third field here. 
So for this example, let's enter 20. 20 percent. And once we're ready, all of our parameters have been inputted. We can click again, run. Here we have our selection of 20% of the fit segments selected. <clears throat> again, everyone's selection will be different. <laughs> so don't worry if it doesn't look the same. This is a separate selection. This is a different exercise. Similar to the way we did it in the first exercise, let's go ahead and save our selection again by clicking on the EA boundaries in our layers panel, right clicking, and clicking save as. We want to make sure that the format is our shape file, and let's give our new selection a name. <coughs> So this is, since this is our second exercise, we'll say exercise two, EA boundary, select, <coughs> so we did 20%. Mm -hmm. And we'll add on to the end our projection to be consistent. And let's click save. And very importantly, make sure that you have save only selected features checked. <coughs> okay. And we'll go ahead and click OK. We have an additional layer that's been added to our layers panel, showing and saving our selection. So in our layers panel, we can turn on and off the view of our selection by clicking on the check boxes here on the side. So we can turn it off by unselecting the check box. <clears throat> and we can move back and forth our different selections or have both. And similar with other shape files in QGIS, we can change the styling to accommodate our needs. So one thing that may be interesting for you to see is once we've saved our selected uh, EAs, we can right click on the, uh, the, the selected EA shape file and we can open the attribute table. And we can see here we have a list of 10 EAs, the exact number that we specified to be selected. Okay. I think everyone is more or less caught up now. So we're going to go on to our third example. Our third example is something very similar. But instead of selecting physical segments, we're now going to select households. And the way we select households is we have to add one additional layer to our current project. Right? And that's the household locations. <clears throat> okay, so f yes, to make things simple, I'm going to t turn off our selected layers for this particular exercise, and I'm going to clear our selection. Okay. Next, I'm going to open up our household locations which is also available on your USB stick under Module 3. Oops. Oops. Um, okay. So this file is HH locations 4326. We're going to copy, move, basically drag over our shape file for those locations into QGIS. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. So now all of our households are lo loaded into QGIS. Just like we selected physical segments, we're going to do the same for the households using the same tool. So we're going to go to Vector, Research Tools, and Random Selection. <clears throat> now, now we're starting to have a large number of layers. Right? But our <coughs> main unit of selection is going to be, this time, is going to be our household locations. So we're going to make sure that we select our household locations layer. <clears throat> and let's say for this exercise, we're going to use the method of percentage of selected features. And <clears throat> let's take a larger sample this time. So we're going to do 40%. And once you're ready, just click Run. It's a bit difficult to make out the difference between the two selections. So I'm going to make change the style of our um, household markers. So let's change that to red. Yes, from the points. So our input layer is going to be our household locations. Okay. So once we've made our selection, we're going to go right click in our layers panel on our household locations layer. We're going to save as. For now, we're going to save this as a shape file. And we'll make another. <clears throat> we'll save this as exercise three. We'll change this to household selection, uh, 40%. Save our boundary. And again, make sure you select save only selected features. OK. So now that we've saved our selection, let's, let's open up our attribute table to have a look at how this data is structured. So for each household location, we have latitude and longitude. Now, this data is quite important if we want to go out into the field, if we want to instruct enumerators to go to this particular point, right? So we have to find a way to export this data outside of QGIS. <clears throat> One of the ways we can do that is to save this layer as a CSV file. And we can use that CSV file as an input table or lookup table in uh, survey solutions later. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to click, right click on our selected households layer. We'll go to Save As. And now, instead of using Shapefile as our format, we can save it as a CSV file, comma separated value. <clears throat> Again, we specify a file name. <clears throat> we'll say Selected Exercise. Three selected households coordinates. <clears throat> we'll save and we'll click OK. OK. So now we have a. F yes? Oh, okay. 
So the first, the, the second one in our list of layers is the shape file where, of our selection. The top one is just a CSV file. Okay. So let's try opening up that CSV file in Excel, just to show you that this data can be accessed outside of the QGIS environment. So I'm going to go to the location where I saved my CSV file and just open it up using Excel. All right. And just like in QGIS, when we opened up the attribute table, our latitude and longitude coordinates are available in their own columns. Yes? Oh, sure. OK. So <clears throat> if you want to save the selected layer as a CSV file, we're going to go to our Layers panel. We're going to right click, go to Save As. And under the first option, Format, we're going to select Comma Separated Value. So in our first two, three examples, we've run a random selection across the whole, country, or the whole boundary, right? What happens, what about if we need to specify the number of selected areas per each of the segments? So that's what we're going to cover in our next exercise. And to do that, we're going to clean up our um, our project environment a little bit because things are starting to get quite <coughs> cluttered. So I'm going to just remove all the different layers because we've already saved them. Or I hope you have. <coughs> okay. And I'm just going to remove everything except for the, our enumeration area boundaries, the household locations, and our satellite base map. <coughs> Okay, let me just reorder things to make things look pretty. Okay, so now the only things on your screen should be the base map, EA boundary, and the household location. <clears throat> Actually, let's turn off the view of the household locations for this next example as well. <clears throat> so all we're left with is the EA boundaries <clears throat> themselves. <clears throat> okay. So how do we specify the number of selected points per each physical segment? This requires a different function, but it's in the same menu. So let's go up to Vector, Research, and we're going to click on Random Points Inside Polygons Fixed. Now be careful a little bit because there are two functions with very similar names. There is Random Points Inside Polygons Fixed, and random points inside polygons variable. But for the first exercise, we're going to only going to look at fixed. <clears throat> so let's click on that. <clears throat> this one <clears throat> has a few more parameters that we need to specify. <clears throat> Our first parameter is the input layer. <clears throat> Since we're working with the EA boundaries, we're going to make sure that our input layer is our EA boundary layer. Let's click, let's specify that. Okay. Our sampling strategy, there's two uh, types of strategies we can do. We can do count or density. But here, uh, for this particular exercise, we're going to do point count. In the third field, we can specify the number of points that we want per physical segment. <clears throat> So here, I'm going to put the number 3. 
So this will do three sampling points for each of the segments within our whole boundary. We can also specify a minimum distance, but <clears throat> uh, we'll keep it at zero for now. That's fine. <clears throat> we can also specify um, <clears throat> a file name, but let's just run it as a temporary layer for now. Okay. Once all your parameters have been specified, we'll just click Run. Okay. And now, in every segment of your EA boundary, should have five sampling points. So let's zoom in and verify whether this is true or not. Oh, wait, sorry, we only did three. <laughs> so let's count them. So we have one, two, and three dots. Okay. And if you really don't believe me, we can switch to another segment and count again one, two, and three. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Okay. So now that we have our random points drawn on the map, I want to show you one more file format we can save them as for export into other programs. <clears throat> so what we can do is we go to our Layers panel. We'll, go, we'll click on our Random Points layer. Right click and click on Save As. Yeah. So, so far, we've saved our layers as one, our shape file, and second, a CSV file. Another um, nice format that's useful for us is we can also save this as a GPX file for loading into handheld GPS units. And this, we will just select here under Format, GPS Exchange Format, GPX. Let's give it a file name. Since this is our fourth exercise, <coughs> oops, we'll just say um, random selection fixed <coughs> GPX. Mm -hmm. We'll put on the <coughs> projection at the end. Okay, let's save. And we don't, for this purpose, we won't make any other changes to the setting, but we'll click OK. Oops. OK. Okay. So now we have a GPX file in our folder <coughs> that we can refer to in other programs <coughs> outside of QGIS. Okay. <coughs> okay. And <coughs> I'll give you some time to play around with that before moving on to the next exercise. My apologies, so I made a slight mistake. <laughs> um, there is an issue in exporting this particular file to a GPX format because we only have one field in our attribute table. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we actually have to add in our latitude and longitude coordinates to the attribute table. Um, <clears throat> I, I misread it on my order sheet. Uh, so let's just focus on the actual selection for this example. So we're just going <clears> to <throat> make sure that we've selected three points 
inside each of our segments, and we can save it as a, a shape file for now. <clears throat> so our next exercise deals with what happens when we don't want to have the same number of selected points in each of our segments. Right? So we have maybe some areas have more agricultural areas than others, and we want to specify points at different, for different segments. <clears throat> so for that, we're going to set up our environment again. So let's uh, remove our random points <clears throat> from our layer panel, just for the sake of working from a clean environment. Okay. However, to specify the number of points that we want to have sampled for each of the individual segments, we're going to have to add a field to our attribute table so that QGIS knows how many points should be sampled from each of the segments. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to do to that is we're going to right click on our EA boundary layer file, and we're going to open up the attribute table. Okay. And what we're going to do here is we're going to add one additional column that tells QGIS how many points should be sampled for that particular state segment. Now, there's a lot of segments here <coughs> that we would have to define, so I'm going to create a, f a calculated field a random number that tells QGIS how many sample points there should be. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so for that, we're going to click on our open field calculator. <clears throat> and we're going to add a function called random. R-A-N-D. Right? And the way the random function works is you specify a minimum value and a maximum value. So there's QGIS will assign a number for each segment between zero and some, between a minimum value and a maximum value. So for the, our purpose, let's keep the seg, uh, sample points relatively small. So let's do random between zero and five. Or actually, let's do random between one and five. So at least we have one point in each of our segments. <clears throat> oh, oops. oops. Sorry. Silly. <laughs> Apologies again. I missed a step, so we have to be in editing mode. So if we go back to our attribute table, let's turn on editing, toggle editing mode first. And then we'll go ahead and add our calculated field. <clears throat> Here, <clears throat> 0 and 5. <clears throat> and we'll put in an output field name. Let's just say uh, number. Um, or you can just say sample units. Or, that's too long. Just say samples. OK. And we'll click OK. So now we have an additional column in our attributes table specifying the number of sample units for that segment. Yes? So now that we have a column specifying the number of samples, let's try dropping those samples for each of the segments. <clears throat> so for that, we're going to go back to our vector menu, look at our research tools, and like before, we're going to choose a function called random points inside polygons, but this time, we're going to choose the function that has variable. This allows us to specify how many points per segment. OK. And we have a number of parameters here. <clears throat> OK. So our input layer, again, will be our EA boundaries. 
our sampling strategy, we'll put points count. <clears throat> and we have a new field here, which is the number field. This allows us to specify the number of sampling points for that particular segment. And if you remember, we, in our attribute table, we added one additional column called samples. So we're going to select samples from our number field. Does everyone see their new created field under the options? OK. <clears throat> now, we're also going to do one additional item here. So there's an additional parameter called minimum distance. Minimum distance allows us to specify the minimum distance between the sampled points. Right? Because we are selecting at random, the points in some iteration can end up next to each other. But the minimum distance parameter allows us to tell QGIS that one point should be at least this distance away from another point. <clears throat> so just to try this, oh, also, one other thing I should note is the minimum distance is specified in degrees. Right? <clears throat> That's a little bit <clears throat> uh, difficult, but let's do uh, 1.01. And this is, I think, about 1.02 1, 1 kilometers, depending on where you are on <laughs> um, in relation to the equator. <laughs> OK. And once we specified all that, let's click Run. It takes a little bit of time. <laughs> OK. So now we have the number of points as specified in our attribute table for each of the segments. <clears throat> and I should probably turn off the editing mode here. <laughs> OK. So everything looks cleaner. OK. So that brings us to the end of this example. So we'll give you a few minutes just to uh, catch up and better understand how this function works. <clears throat> So that covers all the methods that I wanted to cover for specifically for point sampling, uh, selection of points. <clears throat> um, okay, so we've done physical segments now, and we've done point <clears throat> selections. The next one, the next type of sampling we're going to do is we're going to draw a point grid. So a point grid is just a grid of equidistant points. So on the map, we're just going to specify points <clears throat> equidistant from each other in a grid format. <clears throat> and we're going to draw that grid over <clears throat> the top of our EA boundary. <clears throat> so this is kind of this is useful if we have like say a systematic sampling methodology where we need to select points <clears throat> in a very consistent manner. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> so let's set, reset our environment. So <clears throat> we're going to, for this particular exercise, we're just going to need the EA boundaries and the satellite base map. So let's remove the other layers for now. OK. <clears throat> OK. So, so they we're all starting on the same point. <clears throat> For the, to, uh, to overlay a point grid, we're going to use another function from the same menu. So we're going to go to Vector. We're going to go to Research Tools. <clears throat> and we're going to use something called regular points. Okay. Here we have a range of parameters. So input extent. So this is how far the grid should extend. There's two ways we can specify this. The first way is we can specify the extent of our grid using our particular layer. Right? 
<clears throat> the second way is we, we can select a portion of our <clears throat> um, layer, or on our canvas, rather. So the first method, we're gonna use the first method for now. So we're gonna say select, use layer, canvas extent. Okay? A pop-up menu will come up asking to which layer you want to use to specify the extent of that point grid. So we're gonna select our EA boundaries. <clears throat> we'll click OK, and in that box, will be filled automatically the, um, the co GPS coordinates of the extent of our point grid. <clears throat> okay. The second parameter that we have to specify is how far the points should be from one another. <clears throat> okay. So here, we want them to be around one kilometer away from each other. And remember, this number we input is in degrees. Uh -huh. So we're going to put 0 0.01. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and we'll leave the other options the same for now. Okay. All right. Once we've specified all those options, we're going to click Run. Okay, so now we have points overlaid on our EA boundary in an equidistant <coughs> from each other. Okay, and we're gonna ch now we're going to check to make sure that those points are in fact equidistant from each other. So let's zoom in to one particular area. Where we <coughs> May take some time to load. <clears throat> and we're going to use another tool called the measure tool. Uh, the measure tool is on your toolbar at the very top, or measure line tool, if you want to be specific. We're going to click that. It's like a little ruler with a small bar line on top. <clears throat> and he, the way we measure between points we have this little cursor with a little um, <clears throat> X shape. And we're going to click on our starting point, or one of the points. And then we're going to move our cursor to the next point and click again. So we can see in our window on the right here that the distance is about <laughs> one point <clears throat> um, one. <clears throat> Uh, meters in distance. 1.1 oh, 1. 1 kilometers, sorry. Yes? Okay, sure. So, <clears throat> all right, again, we're going to go to our measure, tool, measure line tool in our toolbar. We're going to select that tool. <clears throat> Once we select it, we have a, <clears throat> like a cross-shaped cursor, and we're going to select the first point, the starting point, f from where we want to measure from. We select, and then we move on to the next, our next point within our sequence. We click again, and in our pop-up box, the first reading is the distance between those two points. And because we specified the distance in our parameters as 0.01, that is equivalent here to about 1.1 <clears throat> kilometers. And we can verify the distances between each of the points again just by going around in a square to see that in each segment of our line is in fact around the same distance. Okay. Um, so I should probably extend this window a little bit so they can see all the measurements. Yeah. So my, my mouse skills are not great, but <clears throat> what you should be seeing is that all of the seg each of the line segments should be approximately the same length. <clears throat> How 
how big the boundary is? Yeah, of course. So we can, if everyone is, wants to see that, you can also use the measure tool to measure area. Right? But we have to be very careful with measuring area. If we, ha uh, we have the right projection. <laughs> so with measuring area tool, it's the same, or let's. <clears throat> We'll just, from our starting point, we'll go around in a square. And we'll see that it's about <clears throat> 1.2 square kilometers. <clears throat> OK. All right. OK. <clears throat> Oops. OK. So does everyone have equidistant points of around one kilometer? <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> OK. So let's zoom out again to our, the extent of our layer, of the EA boundary layer. So <clears throat> our grid now extends onto the ocean, right? But we're probably not interested in taking a sampling point in the ocean. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to ensure that that sampling point lies within the EA boundaries. <clears throat> so we have another tool available to us called the clip tool. <clears throat> so here, <clears throat> we can go back to our vector menu. <clears throat> we'll go to our geoprocessing tools and select another function called clip. <clears throat> OK? And clip allows us to cut our point grid into the shape of our EA boundary. <clears throat> so the input layer for this function is going to be the points that we want to cut or clip. <clears throat> our clip layer is the layer that will define the outline. <clears throat> right? And we want to use our EA boundaries for that. So we're going to select van EAs for our clip layer. <clears throat> and we, for now, let's create a temporary layer. And we can click Run. Okay. <clears throat> if you notice, it'll create a new layer <clears throat> in our layer panel. But it's not visible at the moment because the order is a little bit out of. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can turn off the view for our regular points. And it'll show now that we have equidistant points clipped for within the EA boundary. <clears throat> okay. So I think we've covered all the uh, types of point sampling up to this point. <clears throat> so I just wanted to leave here with a few uh, points. You know, point sampling has some drawbacks to it. Right? <clears throat> so one of the things when you do point sampling is you have to specify a buffer around that point. The, so the enumerator has to know what extent they are looking at around that particular point. So it really depends on what kind of statistical activity that you are doing what kind of topic <clears throat> you are um, looking to understand more deeply. Um, <clears throat> but you can, spec you can usually st tell the enumerator, say, you go to this point, and then record information within three meters of this point, or within five meters of this point. It's called a buffer area. <clears throat> the other issue in point sampling is since we're assigning the points randomly, and we're not quite sure where that point will end up landing. Right? <clears throat> Sometimes the points that we specify can be very difficult to travel to. So I just wanted to show you this picture from one of the field surveys that we did. So the point that we ended up specifying was actually in the middle of um, a random field. But there was no roads that actually led to that random point. 
So we actually had to climb over fences just to get to that sampling point. So this is one of the considerations that you should look into when doing a point sample survey. You know, that it can be very difficult. Uh, so one other consideration is that sometimes the point lands on a slope. Right? It could be very dangerous for the enumerator to go collect information on, say, a slope that's <clears throat> very um, steep and they can easily fall. So the next thing we're going to do is very similar to our point sample. The next type of sampling unit is called our grid or mesh segment. It's basically we're going to define squares on our um, <clears throat> sample area. So the way we define squares, we use a different function called the vector grid function. So to be, before we begin, we're going to reset our environment again. Let's uh, remove our, <clears throat> our point layers. And we're going to go back to the environment, our default environment of having just the EA boundary and the base map. <clears throat> OK. Now, to create a grid, it's very similar to what we did in the previous ex exercise. We're going to go to our vector menu. We're going to go to research tools. And we're going to select a function called vector grid. Okay. Now we have a number of parameters that we can specify. Okay. The first one is our grid extent to how wide that grid should be. Similar to how we did the point sample grid, we're going to write, we're going to click on the three dots at the end of the first parameter, and we're going to use our layer to specify how wide that grid should be. So let's click Use Layer, and we're going to select from the drop down menu our EA boundaries. Okay? Next, we have two options dealing with the spacing. <clears throat> Again, both of these parameters are specified in degrees. <clears throat> so let's, keeping consistent with our previous example, let's create a grid with the spacing of about one, kilometer, one square kilometer. So we can specify in our oh, one other point is vector grids are not necessarily squares, right? We can actually make larger rectangles of irregular size. <clears throat> but for this particular example, we're going to make perfect squares. So the number that we put into our x spacing and the number we put into our y spacing should be exactly the same. So for our x spacing, Let's do, again, 0 0.01. And let's make sure that our Y spacing is the same number. Okay. In our grid type, we have two options. Uh, since we want to use these grids as sampling units later on, we want to be able to select them as polygons. So for the grid type, we're going to output the grid as polygons. Okay. Once you've set all your parameters, you can go ahead and click Run. Okay. And just like our point grid, <coughs> we, <coughs> our grid gets overlaid over our EA boundary. Mm -hmm. And similar to our point grid, we can also clip it so that the grids only fall within our EA boundary. So we're, we can clip it by going back to our vector tools, going to our geoprocessing tools menu, and selecting clip. Okay. Again, similar to our point sampling exercise, our input layer will be the grid layer. And our clip layer, the one that we want to specify the boundaries for, will be our EA boundary. 
So let's click or select the EA boundary layer and let's click run. Takes a little bit of time for this. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. So we, our output type is polygons. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn off the grid for view so that it's, things are a bit easier to see. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So now we have a grid overlaying our EA boundary. No. The next step we want to do is we probably want to select some grid from our <coughs> entire mesh. So we can use the same skills that we learned in our first exercise we can use the random <coughs> selection tool. A ra yes. Random selection tool. Yes. <coughs> okay. okay. In our random selection tool, we can specify our input layer. Our grid is in the in a layer called clipped. So we're going to select clipped as our input layer. And similar to how we did it with the random points and the random physical segments, we can specify either the number of po number of point number of grids to be selected or the percentage. Right? <laughs> so for this exercise, let's try percentage of selected features and let's do a sample of 20%. And once we've specified all those parameters, we can click Run. Now we have a sampled <coughs> selection of individual grids in our mesh. Okay. And now that we have our samples selected, we should probably save our sample selected. We can do that by going back to our layer panel, to our the layer where we make the selection, which is our clipped layer, right-clicking, save as. Let's make sure the format is the shape file. Okay. Let's give our, our selected layer a file name. <coughs> um, one, two, three, four, five. This is our sixth exercise. <laughs> and let's do grid selection. OK. And let's be consistent here with our projection. OK. Let's save. And remember, we want to ensure that we are only selecting the selected features. So be sure to click that box. <coughs> And we want it to include it in our map for further analysis. So let's be sure we have add saved file to map selected. Once we're ready, we'll click OK. Okay. So now all of our sampled points <coughs> are overlaid on our EA <coughs> boundaries. So let's turn off the clipped view just so we can see the grids more clearly. <coughs> And let's change some of the styling so that we can see the under what's under each of these grids. Okay. So let's make our fill transparent and let's make our outline something easier to see like red. Okay. And maybe let's make the border a bit uh, <clears throat> larger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm, it's okay. 
All right. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay. So now we have a selected grid point. Um, <clears throat> the next step would probably be to export it to um, <clears throat> We can, from this, we can create, like, say, a map for the enumerator. Or if we have a second stage of selection, we can actually do equidistant points within the grid itself. <clears throat> so throughout all the exercises that we've been doing today, we've always used our EA boundaries in total as our extent. But we can just as easily just select one of these grids and drop random points into them right? <clears throat> and use that as our extent instead. Yeah, so in preparing for, say, a survey, you can export it, this selected grid to a, a map type product uh, telling the enumerator um, to, <clears throat> how to travel there. You can also prepare, to continue preparing the attribute table for each of the meshes, um, <clears throat> providing um, columns where you can specify further geographic codes, um, spaces where the crop grown where that particular mesh can be included into the table, some of the land uses, and also uh, <clears throat> a photo. Okay. So this kind of feeds into our, um, <clears throat> our objectives for tomorrow, right? So now that we have our samples selected, our next step is to go to the field. And our objective tomorrow is to <clears throat> use our CAPI or tablets to go collect some of this information associated with each of our sample units. <clears throat> so that we can collect some of this information <clears throat> required by our questionnaire or our survey. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share a particular example of where we can use these type of sampling grids. So we usually use this for something maybe like a land cover field survey. Right? So <clears throat> we will send enumerators out to the field to a particular point um, somewhere in our specified area. We'll ask the enumerator to jot down a few different points, namely looking at things like what is the land use of that particular point? <clears throat> if there are crops grown, what are the crops? <clears throat> uh, we can also ask them to take a photo of that particular sample area. And all of these items help us to inf build what we call a land cover map. <clears throat> Just like the example that I showed in uh, the previous presentation. And I just added one slide here <clears throat> just to show you um, some of the photos that we take during a land cover survey. Uh, <clears throat> here, the four pictures around the edges are pictures of the, the sample area. We also take pictures, a close detailed picture of the crop that's grown. <clears throat> and uh, mainly uh, one picture of the particular point where that, uh, the point or grid was specified. <clears throat> um, one other point that we should consider is that point sampling uh, can, the points that we sample cannot always be reached, either through physical barriers or whether it's really unsafe for the enumerator. So we have to adapt when <clears throat> um, these points cannot be reached, usually by informing the supervisor that this area is not, and then we'll, maybe the enumerator will be allocated to another sample unit. Okay. And it's also important to monitor if the enumerator has, in fact, reached that point. So 
one way to verify that the numerator has actually reached that point is by taking the photo. And I mentioned that when we're taking the photo, each of the photos usually has some kind of location metadata attached to it. So we can verify that that photo was taken at the, the sample point. Another more secretive way they can be done is through CAPI. So CAPI allows us, or some software at least, allows us to track the location of the enumerators while they are in the field. <clears throat> so we can actually, if we go into the, what we call paradata of our CAPI application, we can actually look at the, the line in which the enumerator walked to reach that sample path. So that brings us to the end of two different, or the main methods of selecting from physical segments, <coughs> selecting household units, uh, <coughs> dropping random units into segments, <coughs> dropping random units uh, based on a particular variable, that is specifying how many samples should be taken from a particular boundary. We learned how to drop a point grid and we also learned how to specify a mesh grid like these squares in this example. <coughs> now, there's one more uh, type of sampling which is the transect and that requires an installation of a different plugin. <coughs> um, so if everyone is ready, uh, we can try installing this plugin. Uh, if it's not possible, then maybe we can just end early for the day. But uh, at least I wanted to show you how transect samples can be taken. <coughs> Okay, so the transect plugin is called Transectizer. It's a very interesting name. <laughs> so here's the name, Transectizer. <coughs> and this plugin allows us to specify in a set of points in one line. Again, uh, this type of sampling is maybe sometimes particularly useful if you are using like a fixed wing drone where you need to select or look at a sample area that are of a long and thin segment. <clears throat> or if you're looking at nomadic livestock, which um, tends to migrate in a, lo in a very uh, predictable, uh, straightforward line. Okay, so the plugin was pretty quick to uh, install. In the interest of time, I'm just going to walk you through the steps of how Transectizer plugin works. <clears throat> so I'm going to reset our environment here, just so that we have, again, our base default uh, project. So we're just going to have our EA boundaries and our satellite base map. <clears throat> okay, so the way we access the Transectizer plugin is by going back to our vector menu <clears throat> and we're going to go down to Transectizer and click again Transectizer. Um, okay, oops. There we go. Okay. And here, oops. Okay. <clears throat> this is the, the plugin window, how it's used. There's three main steps to follow here. <clears throat> um, basically, we can click on each step individually. So we're on the first step, so we're going to click on 1, which is to set the output layer. 
This is the layer on which our points will be, our sample points will be in our project. <clears throat> so we're going to create a new layer, and let's call, <clears throat> call the layer uh, tr transect. Okay. <clears throat> That's the first step. <clears throat> the second step is to click number two, <clears throat> which involves a few more parameters that we have to define. <clears throat> You know, <clears throat> the first parameter is we have to define where we want to start the sample points from. Remember, we're trying to specify a set of points along a line. So we have to specify the starting point of that line. <clears throat> so you can either specify that point manually by entering in the, the, la the longitude and the latitude coordinates of that starting point. You can get it from GPS if your device has GPS. But since we don't here, we're going to click Automatic Definition. Automatic Definition allow brings up a cursor in which we can select a point on our canvas. <clears throat> so let's say around this <clears throat> eastern side of the island. <clears throat> Once we've selected that point, <clears throat> our fields in our plugin become automatically filled. <clears throat> the next <clears throat> parameter that we have to specify is the transect bearing. This determines which direction we are going to sample our units from the starting position. Now, the bearing is specified in 360 degrees format, right? <clears throat> so if we leave our default as 90 degrees, our line will travel from our point to the right. But let's say we want our line to move to the left. How do we do that? To the left, we have to specify on the other side, which is 270 degrees. So let's change our bearing to 270. <clears throat> okay. Next is the number of stations. The number of stations is basically equivalent to how many points do we want to sample along the line. <clears throat> so we're going to say for this example, we're 10. We want to sample 10 points along the line. <clears throat> and the last parameter you want to specify is what is the distance between each of the points on our line. <clears throat> so let's keep this as one, but change our distance units to, say, kilometers. Mm -hmm. So the distance between each point in our line will be one kilometer, exactly. <clears throat> okay. Then we click on the number three as our last step. <clears throat> Let's keep these as default for now, and we'll click on the button Create New Transect. Once we click that button, we'll have a new layer in our environment that shows a straight line with a set of sampling points, moving from our starting point in a bearing of 270 degrees or to the left of our starting point in a straight line. The, the main objective of this session was just to give you kind of a tool set on the different ways that we can sample points from the EA boundaries that we've already spent the last two days to defining. Right? So like I said, our next steps from this point is once we've already defined the units that we want to sample, the next steps in our survey cycle will be to actually go out to the field to visit these points that we've sampled or selected collect that data, and then bring that data back into our classroom environment and help us to produce some reports. Right.